Welcome to No Tourists Allowed, a podcast where two travel industry executives with a combined 71 years on the inside of travel and technology give up their secrets to do the thing everyone wants to do. Travel better, pay less, and see more of the world. Here are your hosts, Mike Putman and James Ferrara. Hello, everyone. I'm Mike Putman. And I'm James Ferrara. Welcome back to No Tourists Allowed. And we're almost uh, live. Uh, we're certainly together this time where we're normally in two different parts of the country or different parts of the world. So uh, we happen to be having a meeting this week. And so uh, we're doing this podcast together rather than apart. Yeah, we might might look a little squeezed on your if you're watching us on YouTube or on our website. Uh, so you have to widen your screen, widen it probably more for me than for <laughs> Mike. But you have to widen your screen. Yeah. Anyhow, very happy to be here. You know, we took a little time off uh, late in the summer, uh, but we're back to our full schedule. And uh, Mike and I have been on the road quite a bit, and we've been out there uh, meeting people around the world, meeting yep. some new folks in the travel industry or related. And in fact, we have a special guest today that falls into that category. Yeah, I'd like to introduce uh, to our audience, Mr. Julian Keel. He's the CEO of Points Path. Welcome, Julian. How are you? Hey, thank you so much, Mike, James. It's really great to be here. I appreciate you having me on. Uh, thank you, Julian. And, you know, we're going to talk about a bunch of things with you, but uh, I, I said to you when we first met, we were chatting a little bit, um, the idea of points and rewards in travel and air travel is so interesting to me because despite my industry background, I feel kind of lost in this area. I am very good at racking up points and, <laughs> and saving them. I actually have over a million points with United, for example, as just one account, but I just never seem to know what to do with them. Or if I know what to do with them, I'm not successful at it. So really interested to hear um, from you today. But we want to talk about other things with you too. And the, the first thing is to get to know you a little bit. Sure. So, uh, you know, what we do with a lot of our guests is we start out with some rapid fire questions and don't worry, we won't ask you anything too personal, but <laughs> yeah. we want to kind of open up uh, a little bit about you as a traveler, not just as a travel professional, um, and learn a little bit more about your likes and dislikes. So I'm going to give you several different questions uh, just in succession. If you'll just give us a quick one word or short phrase answer, then we'll move on to the next one. All right. Got it. Yep. Let's fire All right. away. So, Julian, what is your favorite hotel brand or an individual property, and and why is that? Hyatt. They have by far the best uh, hotel loyalty program. Aha! Uh -huh. And that's your reason is because they have the best. That is program. that is okay. exactly right. That's uh, World of Hyatt. World of Hyatt. We can talk a little about that uh, as we go here. I might debate you on that one, but uh, <laughs> okay. I'm a Marriott guy. But uh, um, but anyhow, we'll go to the next one. What's your favorite destination? Uh, and do you have, and, and with that destination, is there a favorite restaurant you have or some type of experience that you've had at that destination? Oh, you know, I love Lake Tahoe and I have not been there in a long time. But the reason I love it is because it, uh, I'm able to engage in my two favorite activities, which is skiing and gambling. Uh, so <laughs> probably neither of which are probably too healthy for me or, or at least safe. Certainly don't do them at the same time. And you do not do them <laughs> at the same time. That's right. But I really do. It's a beautiful, beautiful place to go. If you've never been, it's, it's absolutely gorgeous. It is. We're holding an event, um, there next year at the Rich Colton. Oh, that's going to be gorgeous. Yeah. Do you have a casino there? Which side is on the Ritz? Yeah, is Ritz on the Nevada side or the California side? Okay, so now I think it's the California <laughs> side. But we could drive over. I mean, if it's the yeah. California side, there's no gambling there, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. There's drinking and eating, though. All yeah. right. We'll, we'll knock out two, two of our favorite topics. Consolation prize. Yeah. <laughs> so have you ever been on a cruise? I have been on a cruise once. Uh, and actually, it is the uh, only cruise I will ever be on, not because I didn't enjoy it, but I actually ended up having uh, an, an issue. Uh, you may not have heard of it. It's called Malda de Bachmann syndrome. And it happens sometimes to people who are on a long cruise, like seven days, where you get off the boat and your body continues to rock. 
Yeah. And it can go on for, for me, it went on for three months. It's pretty wretched and uh, pretty awful. Uh, it does, fortunately for most people, eventually go away. But uh, I won't be on going on any more cruises as a result, which is a shame. I had a really nice time. I cruised to a Well, Alaska. sorry to hear that. I mean, that does happen to me for a day or two. Sure, yeah. People get sea legs. But uh, no, this this goes on for uh, for months. It's It's pretty wretched, as they say. Well, there's plenty of other ways to travel in other places in the world. Fortunately. Yeah. So, Julian, when you fly, are you an aisle guy or a window guy? Aisle. I'm an aisle guy. Yep. I want to be able to get up when I want to without having to climb over somebody. So, aisle for you. Aisle, and do you carry or check your luggage? Carry, but I don't want to be the guy who's taking a bag, trying to force a big bag into the overhead. So, I, I, I carry, but I always make sure I've got a suitcase that fits the requirement. There you go. Oh, so this is a big debate here at No Tourists Allowed because I travel with several trunks and Sherpas and Mike, you know, seems to breeze on board with a carry-on all the time. At least you're not the guy that shoved his suitcase over my uh, backpack and broke my laptop screen oh. in the, you know, I mean, it's getting crazy yeah. on planes with all this carrying on. It's like people with like, chickens and goats and i don't know what they're <laughs> so julian tell us tell us a little bit about uh so we're over with the rapid fire question so now uh tell us a little bit about your background as it relates to the travel industry or travel in general absolutely yeah so i actually my career before this my first career was in television and film uh, i was a writer i was a director and one of the last jobs I did in that industry, I worked for WWE, World Wrestling Entertainment. Hmm. Oh, I was a fun. director. Yes, I was directing all the behind the scenes uh, of videos, all the scenes behind the scenes. So uh, when somebody's in the locker room and one another guy comes in, they look at each other and they say, hey, I'm going to kick your ass out there, that sort of thing. <laughs> right, exactly. Uh, so for about two years, I did that. And I was traveling with the entire uh, crew and 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 uh, and uh, wrestlers, performers, uh, to a different city every week, uh, two different cities, in fact, to do Monday Night Raw Live and Friday Night SmackDown. Uh, so very quickly, I learned almost everything there is to know about frequent flyer miles, as does everybody else at WWE. As you would imagine, there's a lot of people there. There's a subculture about points and miles because everybody is traveling all the time. So. Everybody really knows their points and miles well. In any case, I did that for two years. I left. That's about as long as you want to do wrestling for. You don't really need to do it longer than that. Uh, and I had all this knowledge, and I was kind of wrapped up, time to wrap up on film and television, looking for a change. I had all this knowledge. I had this writing uh, skills. So I started writing about points and miles for a small blog at the time. It was called Hack My Trip. From there, I ended up writing for a bigger blog called Frequent Miler. And then I ended up uh, being hired by the big one, which is the points guy, which you may have heard of. A lot of people know it. I spent several years there, actually eventually became the editorial director there and was running it. Uh, and then I got uh, invited to come over to CNN and start their coverage of travel rewards and credit cards and that sort of thing. I was there at CNN, their uh, underscore division for three years. And uh, through it all, I really just wanted to find a way to help people use their miles, what James was talking about earlier, uh, know, learn how to burn your miles, when to burn them, how to burn them without having to spend hours looking through a website or a blog or whatever it might be. And that is why I started Points Path. And that is what we try and do with Points Path. Awesome. What a, what a history and what a way to create a product. You know, uh, a lot of great products always uh, come from finding uh, a problem and creating a product to solve that problem. And with no doubt in the travel industry, points and utilizing points are, are a big problem to solve. So tell us about your product and how it works. Yeah, that's exactly it, Mike. So when I know from all my experience, but also we did a lot of, you know, talking to consumers and travelers and asking them what was specifically the problems they had when it came to using frequent flyer miles. A lot of people are like James. They, they, they have earned a ton of miles, but they don't know when to use them. Uh, and the, it really comes down to two things. One, people have trouble finding flights they actually want to use their miles on, flights they actually want to take that don't have two stops or whatever it might be. And then two, even when they do find a flight, 
they can't tell if they're getting a good deal or not because every type of mile is different. Every uh, program is worth a different amount. So they can't tell should they use their miles on this particular flight or should they just pay cash. And that is entirely what PointsPath is designed to do. It's a browser extension. It runs in Google Chrome or Microsoft Edge. When you install it, it runs on top of Google Flights, which I'm sure you gentlemen know Google Flights is one of the more popular search engines for for travelers, for flyers. Uh, So that when you do a search in Google Flights with PointsPath installed and you search, say, New York to Los Angeles on October 5th, uh, Google gives you, of course, all the cash prices and all the flights. PointsPath adds all the points prices next to each of those flights, the live points prices, and then indicates with an arrow whether you should be using cash for that flight or using miles for that flight, whether it's a good deal with miles or whether it's a great deal with miles. And that is literally what we're trying to do is just give people that piece of information. And is it when so when you do that, and and I'm curious because I haven't used the tool yet, um, does it bring back real inventory and real pricing uh, in terms of the point side? It is. It is live pricing. So what we do is when you do that search from New York to Los Angeles on October 5th or whatever it might be in Google Flights, we do the exact same search that you uh, that you have put in on through each airline, uh, just as if you were doing the search yourself, as if you were opening up Delta.com and putting in that same search and getting the results. Then when we get the results, we match them up with the Google Flights and make it all line up. And and then we use our data to calculate which is the better deal. So yeah, it is not cached data. It is not old data. Uh, The only time we cache at all is if you just did the search a few moments ago and you go to another day and then you come back, you'll get the same results you just got. But that's purely for speed so that you don't have to sit there and wait for us to get the same results again. But it is live data. The fulfillment to actually purchase the ticket, then you're going through to the airline's website and maybe even you have to log in as a, a member, use your points, whatever. Correct. So what we do is in Google Flights, as you know, if you click on a flight, you then get Google's booking page, which will send you to the airline site for cash. We add an additional link for the points. So when you click on that, you get taken to the airline site on the point search side. From there, yes, of course, you have to log in because you have to be able to spend your points. But the search is already there put together for you, so you don't have to go find it again. That is really cool. Uh, You know, and it it was, I mean, just really timely um, because I've been doing extensive searches trying to get to Italy in a premium class of service. uh, And it is extremely high for actually for travel next week. So uh, this is something I will deploy today. Um, so approximately how many airlines do you have in your, uh, in your search? So we ha- currently have six programs, the big three, Delta, United, American. We also cover JetBlue. We cover Alaska Airlines and then Air Canada. But with that said, we cover all of the airline partners of those programs. So in other words, when I say we cover those programs, we mean Advantage Miles for American, Delta Miles, United Miles. But for instance, if American is partnering with British Airways on a flight to London and that flight is available with American miles, we'll show you that. We will show you that you can get that British Airways flight with American miles or any of the partners of each of those programs. So it really does end up uh, encompassing a lot more airlines than just those six. I mean, sounds absolutely great. and really does solve a lot of challenges for me. Um, there's a further calculus, though. Some of these programs have gotten very complicated. I mean, now we have fair families and so on, and we also have status benefits. So my example with United, I have over a million points, but I also have one case status with United, which gives me something called plus points that I can use also. So figuring out the best deal is still really difficult for me. You can show me cash versus points, but now United, I also could consider buying an economy class ticket, upgrading with plus points, or getting on standby for a first class upgrade because of my 1K status, right? And on and on and on. I mean, they really have made it they really have gamed this uh, frequent flyer 
old idea of frequent flyer has become much more complicated now. It, it really is complicated. I, I will tell you one of the things we don't yet cover plus points, but we do want to. And it is on our roadmap, as they say in a startup. With that said, so points path is free, as, as I just described it. Something like that is probably an advanced feature that we would charge a subscription for in, in a bucket of multiple advanced features. One of the things we do, though, do that's already similar, again, as an advanced paid feature, is the ability for people who have Delta American Express credit cards, they get a discount on their points prices. We have that. We do show that availability. You throw a switch, again, if you have the advanced uh, program, and then you can see those different prices that are tailored just for you. Uh, if more, the more we dig into it, the more we want to do exactly what you're saying, James, which is give you a personalized experience and really show you what, what is the best choice for me, given my elite status, my situation. There's even points plus cash now. I've seen a lot of, right? Usually points plus cash in most cases on most airlines is a bad deal. So we probably won't cover it. There are a few exceptions, but uh, for instance, JetBlue does points plus cash. It's, I don't think I've ever seen it be a good deal. You should always use either all points or all cash. You're just not getting enough value for the points you're burning for the basis of the cash you're saving. I have to fly to Austin for Formula One racing in a couple of weeks. The tickets, because everyone is going to Austin for that weekend, are like $1,900 for a premium economy ticket, right? And the points plus cash deal was, you know, 150,000 points plus $1,200. Right. <laughs> That's not worth it, right? You're not, you're not going to burn 150,000 points to save 700 bucks. That's crazy. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. They, listen, sometimes at the end of the day, Points path it gives you all the information that uh, that you need, but it can't change the prices. It is whatever the airline is charging. Now that'd be a great service. That'd be a great tool. <laughs> yes, yeah, sign me up for that. Yeah, <laughs> unfortunately we can't do it, but but it, it it does at least try and help you put it all together. Excellent. Where have you been lately? Uh, I was actually just in Italy, uh, in Florence for a wedding for my my nephew's wedding. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and, uh, I am probably going to go to Los Angeles for the uh, Christmas season to see my, uh, family there. So, uh, yeah, I've always got a little travel uh, plan. And will you use points? You know, that's a great question. I actually haven't booked my travel yet, but people always ask me during the holiday season, should I use my points? Will I get a better deal or a worse deal? We just did a study with the points guy that was just released. Uh, that shows that actually you lose between 6 and 12% of the value of your points when you use them during the holiday season. It varies from airline to airline, but in general, you're going to do worse if you use your points during the holidays. So unless I find a particularly great deal on points path, I'll probably pay cash. So do you have, so in your, the back end, and I'm not trying to get you to expose your secrets, but uh, a question I would have would be, when you're creating a valuation of points versus dollars, you assign, I'm assuming you would assign different values based upon the airlines and how easy they are to spend or earn or maybe both. Is that, is that true? So that a, an American point is not worth the same thing as a Delta point potentially? That's exactly right. So every airline has points and miles that are worth different amounts just depending on their program. So what we do is that every time one of our points path users does any sort of a cert and they get the points prices and the cash prices, we also save a copy of those prices, not of the user's information or of their search, but of the actual prices. We then can analyze all of those prices across an individual airline. And we have something around 9 million saved flights at this point. And we can see what is the median value that you are getting for, say, a Delta mile versus cash, how many cents per mile or a United mile or an Air Canada point, whatever it might be. That is the value that we then use. There's a little secret sauce to it as well, but that is the value that we then use to determine whether it's a good deal or a great deal, whether you should use cash or miles. And actually, the current values that we're using are posted on our website, uh, pointspath.com, in the frequently asked questions. Oh, cool. And I have one other question too, and and again, this is just me trying to learn more about your business and and share with our um, listeners as well. But 
Do you or have you thought of connecting to these companies? There are several companies now that are selling a business class ticket and they're utilizing other people's points and they've created this kind of somewhat of a marketplace where, you know, for me to go as, as, as an example, for me to go to Italy in business class next week, it's like $9,000. And I'm not, of course, I'm not going to do that. But going with one of these guys, they may buy points from someone else and the tickets, they may sell it to me for $4,500. Have you ever thought about integrating with those guys? Or You know, the thing about that, Mike, is that uh, the airlines don't like that. They, they're not fans of people who do that uh, because it really is against the terms and conditions of the program to buy or sell miles. So we really are trying to be respectful of the airlines, of their technology, and not overburden it and not uh, do things that are outside of what, what a normal consumer would do. So uh, it's probably not something that we would consider, but, uh, you know, for people who are looking for deals, that is certainly one way to get them. And I think the way these guys get around it is they're buying like Capital One miles or Chase miles or whatever they are, and then they transfer them and then they you know, move them to an airline, which is maybe technically getting around the rules, although it might not be what the airlines want you to do anyway. But anyhow, just a question about that. Yeah. No, I, I think that's exactly what they're doing. But yeah, I, I think the airlines and the banks are not are not huge fans of it. We also have a guest um, last year, last season, um, the Status Mac yeah. uh, guy, right? Talking yeah. about how you can use your miles and your status with an airline to actually go to a competitor and get an offer, get a deal. So it's interesting. I mean, you really have to use all of your tools and all of our powers to get the most out of these programs and uh, do the calculus. Yeah, and to be clear, that's totally legit what you're describing there and, and something the airlines encourage because they want your business. They want you to leave you know, Delta and come to JetBlue or whatever it might be. So absolutely, you should take advantage of those offers when you can. Mike is always pushing the envelope. I'm trying to keep him out of jail. <laughs> out of airline jail. <laughs> airline jail. Do you, Julian, do you have any like wild success stories maybe from some of your users? You, you know, we we actually hear from our users a lot on social media. We're on TikTok, we're on uh, Instagram and, and all the major platforms. And yeah, we do hear from people. Uh, I got, in fact, an email from a guy just the other day who said, you know, I've never been able to use my British Airways Avios. And I found this great deal. Now, we don't cover Avios, but he found it because he saw that it was available with American Miles and then went over to British Airways and found that it was available at a lower lower price than usual with his British Airways, obvious a business class ticket to, I think it was Milan through London. Uh, so yeah, we we hear those great stories all the time. And it actually, it's the best thing about this job is hearing from people who say, I've never been able to use my American miles. I never know when to use them. This answers that question every time. Thank you. And, and again, just being able to do that for people for free without them having to pay just to get that knowledge. It kind of makes it all worth it. Yeah. Now, for free, let's look at that. <laughs> What's the business model here? So as I said, we do charge a subscription for some advanced features. Uh, in addition, though, we do have other ways that we monetize. When you're using the extension, you may notice that you'll see offers from time to time for credit cards or, or goods and uh, travel goods, things like that. Uh, we do get affiliate commissions on those, and it's a disclosed on our website that we do. Uh, one of the other ways that we uh, monetize is we do have a newsletter, a weekly newsletter, and some of those offers can be in there as well. It's, it is my top five deals of the week, though, so I make sure that it's only good offers. I don't put in lousy offers. Uh, but we are trying to monetize through different channels, and we've actually had some real success with it. So I think that my goal is to keep the base product, Points Path Pride, free for everyone forever and to be able to monetize on these other channels and, and, and make the business work that way. I think we can. And when you say best deals, you're talking about best deals in terms of points. Well, actually, so our newsletter covers travel deals in general. Sometimes they might be points. Sometimes it might be a credit card offer. Sometimes it might be, like, like I said, a, a sale on a piece of luggage or something like that. Uh, in the newsletter, it can be anything. But one of the features we are working on, which again is an advanced feature, 
would be to send you deal alerts when we see a great points price on somewhere from your home airport. We do ask you what your home airport is so we can do that. Um, in addition, one of the other features we're working on is for the ability for you to be able to track a flight to say, hey, this flight that I just found in, in points path, uh, I want you to tell me when the price goes up or down in points. I want you to send me an email. That's another thing that I think we're actually going to have very ready to go very soon. But it won't be part of the free product. So those advanced features are the sort of things that will require a subscription. Any intel that you have on where points programs are going with uh, the airline? And by the way, this is all air. I mean, there are also hotels that have yeah. points programs and so on. Are you involved with that? We have not broached hotels yet. We do hope to at some point. The thing about hotels is there isn't a ubiquitous place like Google Flights that everyone goes to for hotels. So it's a little more tricky to do what we're doing with flights, but it is something we want to do. Okay. And, and any intel on what's coming down the pike with airline programs? You know, it's a really good question because on the one hand, airline programs constantly devalue. The miles are constantly worth less over time. And that's why people like me always say you should earn and burn. Don't sit on a lot of miles because they'll be worth less a year or five years from now than they are today because airlines are constantly raising the amount of points you need for a flight or, or uh, whatever, however it is you're going to redeem them. That being said, in recent months, the U.S. Department of Transportation has begun putting pressure on some of these programs to become more transparent about the value of their miles and asking them, show us how the value of your miles have changed over the years. This is information that you don't give the consumer. We want to know. Uh, I'm interested to see where that goes politically because it very much is against the strain of devaluing miles over time. On the other hand, the more you offer credit card bonuses that are higher and higher, the more miles are out in the ecosystem, the more you kind of have to devalue those miles just like printing more dollars devalues the dollar. So it's a really interesting question, and I'm not exactly sure where it's going to go. Obviously, it's going to depend on the results of the election and things like that. But it, it really, we are at a bit of a turning point where it could kind of go in a different direction than it has been. Yeah, we've had an activist Department of Transportation the last couple of years, and their efforts against customer service policies, for example, you know, have been transformative. Yeah, as far as disclosing baggages and then what what you what rights you have when your flight is canceled and that sort of thing. That's exactly right. Yeah, which I I and listen at points back, we're very pro consumer. That's our entire business is trying to give travelers the information that they couldn't find otherwise or would have trouble finding otherwise. So we a hundred percent support any of these uh, measures that the DOT is enforcing. Sure, you, I'm sure you do. Well, this has been fascinating. I hope I'm your next uh, social media testimonial because I think Mike and I are going to run and <laughs> use it yeah. right so, away. So, Julian, if people if people want to uh, take advantage of your newsletter, which there's no charge for, right? Correct, of course. Yep. Or or your um, Google or Edge plugin. How do they go about doing that? It's really simple. They can go to pointspath.com, P-O-I-N-T-S-P-A-T-H.com. Everything you need to do is right there. You can also find us directly in the Google Web Store if you want to go that way. But uh, usually the best place to start is pointspath.com. You can download the extension, get on the list, uh, and, and start using it immediately. Again, it's all free. Great. Well, we really appreciate having you here. And thanks for your time and participation in No Tourist Allowed. And uh, look forward to giving you some testimonials uh, as we utilize and test out your product. Thank you so much, Mike and James, for having me on. Please let me know what you think of Points Path. We love feedback. We're always improving things, working to make things better. So let me know what you think. All right. Excellent, Julian. Thank you. Thanks. Well, that was really uh, terrific, really engaging. And while we have a few minutes, um, I, we like to share sometimes our own travels. I've been on the road three weeks straight, really. And uh, I started out with such an interesting cruise, the Canada and New England itinerary. Now, this is by no means what you would call adventure cruising right. or expedition right. cruising, right? It's a very tame, easy itinerary, leaving from Brooklyn and New York, going up to Newport, Rhode Island, Boston, sometimes Bar Harbor, Maine, and then to um, St. John, New Brunswick in Canada, and uh, Halifax, Nova Scotia. So tame, easy itinerary. You barely 
leave the country. It's like Canada. So it's putting like one foot outside <laughs> the country. And um, it's happening in September and October, of course, because of the changing leaves. Very beautiful time to cruise this area. But because of that time period, it doesn't attract young families. Kids are in school. And it's a kind of an older crowd, a slower pace to this cruise. So you fit right in. I, I was maybe the youngest guy on the ship. But um, I will say this. I was on Princess. They did a marvelous job. Very elegant. Superb food. Um, and the itinerary is so charming. Beautiful early fall weather. Mid-70s, sunny. The, the ocean like glass. I mean, mm. the easiest kind of cruise. And it's the land of lobster. I mean, everywhere we went, we ate lobster. Every meal, we ate lobster. Uh, New Brunswick and Halifax, you know, lobster, Boston, lobster, Newport, lobster. It was <laughs> pretty cool. Um, and uh, had a lot of lovely experiences. When you get up into St. John and Halifax, well, out in Halifax, you go out to a place called Peggy's Cove, which I think they say they filmed some of the bird the Alfred Hitchcock movie mm -hmm. yeah. out there because it's a little fishing village on the rocks, kind of on a point out in the middle of the ocean and tiny little shacks on these rocks and a lighthouse really like out of a storybook. Um, and uh, beautiful history mansions of Newport and so on. But even on board the ship, I mean, if you get on a good cruise line, great ship, like I was on the enchanted princess, uh, the specialty dining restaurants, the entertainment, um, some special experiences. One night we ate in a dining experience called 360, where you may have seen on other cruise ships, the tables are animated. Like I think it's the Royal Caribbean brands. They have a little chef that runs around on the table. Well, this takes that idea even further. You're in a round room, like a small theater sitting at a table that seats about 20 people, and the entire room is digital. So all the walls around you are running video and animation, and then the tabletop for these 20 people is all animated also. And the tablecloths are changing, and there's activities. At one point, uh, it's a tour. The, the whole experience is a tour of the Mediterranean, and each course of this dinner is in a different country. So when we were in Greece, the tablecloth became blue and white check, and there's music, and there's scenes of Greece all around you, and then people are throwing plates and breaking oh, wow. plates like they do in Greece, yeah. right? And a plate appears in front of you on the tabletop, and then you slap the plate, and it breaks. Oh, wow. If you don't slap the plate, nothing happens. On another one, you're in France, and you're on a farm, with a beekeeper who's making lavender honey. Mm. And as he's talking to you, the bees are crawling up onto the tabletop, and then they start to swarm in front of you. And if you stir them up a little bit, you agitate them, they start to make honey, and the honeycomb starts to fill with honey in front of you. Mm. So there's this interactive, really cool digital experience, beautiful filmography going on around you. Um, pouring wines to pair from each country with each course. Really, really great experience. Not something you would necessarily expect on a cruise ship. So anyway. And this is part of James's job too, by the way. This is my job. I was working. <laughs> so that was the week there. Then I um, uh, had to go to New Orleans. Had to go. They twisted <laughs> my arm. Had to go to New Orleans. And New Orleans is just a good time no matter when you go there. Uh, we had a big event there, and uh, we did some dine-arounds at restaurants in New Orleans. And I swear you could throw a dart in New Orleans and hit a great restaurant every time. Uh, so we were eating out. I was at um, Emerald Lagasse's restaurant, Merrill, and uh, we did a private event at Commander's Palace, the legendary yeah. uh, restaurant where Paul Prudhomme and Emerald Lagasse began his career many years ago. Um, in the Garden District. So we had this beautiful dinner. We had a uh, reception and party at Mardi Gras World, which are these cavernous 
uh, warehouses where they store the float and costumes and everything from the Mardi Gras parade. And so we had cocktails and dinner in amongst all of this stuff, which was really, really fun and felt very New Orleans. But the one thing I kept thinking was, I never want to be here alone at <laughs> night. <Yeah. laughs> like, it's I, like clown faces. Yes. I got the feeling, like, what is it, night at the museum? Yeah. Like, this stuff definitely comes alive when no one's around. Anyhow, you're right on the river, beautiful view of the river. And uh, uh, we stayed at, and did the whole event at the Roosevelt, a Waldorf Astoria Hotel. It's the classic New Orleans hotel. It's like the plaza of New Orleans, uh, all marble and uh, from uh, the early 1900s, and apparently haunted. So oh, didn't know the elevators have this weird thing where they have a sort of mind of their own. They will pass your floor, even though it's lit up, mm -hmm. and then come back to it later. Or you'll press 8, and then 8 will disappear, and 14 will oh. light up. Oh. And then a couple of times, they just stopped. I was stuck in the elevator a few times. Wow. So I'm not sure if you're going to haunt some part of the hotel, I'd rather it wasn't the elevators, but that's the story. Yeah. Uh, I had a great time there. And then finally uh, went on to Napa Valley directly from there. And guys, I want to tell you, uh, I've always loved Napa, but this trip was really a slice of paradise. First of all, it was 100 degrees while we were there, but it's dry and uh, sunny and beautiful. So it was not uncomfortable. Uh, it was just beautiful. We stayed at one of the Auberge resorts. And a Those prior, are nice. A prior trip, I stayed at Auberge du Soleil, very Mediterranean, mm -hmm. hot colors, beautiful little uh, casitas painted different colors, one of the best restaurants in Napa there. This time, we stayed at Solage, an Auberge resort, and totally different, all whites and creams and very sharp and crisp and um, uh, almost like modern farm buildings around, twinkling lights at night, very California, sort of new agey, yoga-ish, big, beautiful spa there. I had a casita of my own with a, uh, a private fenced-in yard, a fire pit, a water fountain feature. I mean, it was really special. Um, thankfully, I was being hosted. I didn't have to pay because I took a peek at the rates and it would make your hair stand on end. I mean, we're talking about like $1,800 a night or more. Um, really, really beautiful. But we did what you do in Napa. At every lunch and dinner, we were at a different winery. And we had a beautiful lunch in the Grove at Camus and got to meet Chuck Wagner, the legendary owner of the Camus uh, winery and vineyards. We had uh, same thing with Mike Davis at Davis uh, Winery, and then Silver Oak, another legendary uh, winery where we had uh, a big dinner reception. And at each of these, you're tasting four or five wines and comparing. I mean, food, wine, sun, gorgeous hotel, wonderful company really a bit of paradise. So if you haven't been up to Calistoga, uh, which is the part of the valley that Solage is in, um, try to get up there and look around. Really, really beautiful. And we were there in September, which they were in the middle of the harvest for the current vintage. That's really the time to go, to see them doing all that work. And, and are you going to claim this is work as well? This was work. Working for Yeah, I'm a little tired from this trip. <laughs> um, now, it just tells you the possibilities of travel, right? People ask me, what is my favorite place? And I think the truth is, when, I'm on the, when, when you put me on the spot like that, I remember like six places I've ever been to. <laughs> yeah. But there are a thousand places <laughs> I've been to, and, uh, and many of them really world-class and spectacular. So get out there, guys. You can't do this from your armchair uh, or even your computer screen. Very happy that you're joining us or listening in, but there's a whole world out there. You live, get out cannot there. live. You can't take your money with you. That's right. That's worth zero when you're dead, but your memories will 
stay with you. Well, listen, guys, we got to wrap up. We got a lot of work to do uh, here. Uh, in the speaking of being on vacation, we're in the Hamptons in James's uh, summer home and <laughs> uh, enjoying uh, a little bit of uh, fun, but having uh, having to do a good bit of work. So, but we appreciate you joining us uh, at No Tours Allowed, and we've got a great season lined up for you. So stick around, and we'll be back next week with another hopefully exciting episode and guest. We've re released a couple of new um, episodes just in the past week. We were saving up a couple of them. Yeah. So if you miss them, please go back. You can look right at notourisallowed.com or, of course, subscribe anywhere you get your podcast, notourisallowed.com uh, or notourisallowed on your podcast subscriptions and uh, see if you can catch up. Absolutely. All right. Thanks, everyone. Till next time. Thank you. Bye-bye.